Hey everyone, what's up and welcome back at another Artist Coaching Podcast with me, Joey Suki. Today you're gonna listen to a long form podcast episode. It's a recording, another recording from me at the MixCon conference in Munich last week. Uh, I was invited to be a part of a panel together with uh, DJ Duo Da Tweakas, uh, with Plastic Funk and Riva Star. And um, we had a talk about, yeah artist careers like how to develop a a decent artist career in 2019 uh, which brought up a lot of interesting topics um, definitely something that's valuable to you as a listener as a dj as an artist Uh, great stuff for you to get out from it and in the end of the panel you can hear me talking um, to some of the people in the crowd who approach me afterwards so Hopefully this is a big one for you. Um, Yeah, let me know if you like these long forms episodes because this is, I think it's it's over an hour, Um, but I've also had shorter ones. So let me know what you guys prefer. Uh, You can send a message on Twitter or on Instagram. Just send a message to me and tag me, say at Joey Suki. I prefer long form or short form. Uh, That would be great so I can know what you guys love more. Again, enjoy listening to this episode and I'll see you next time. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Josuki. <laughs> Born in Italy, now living in London, I think, right? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, here is uh, producer, DJ, and label owner, Riva Star. <laughs> and last but not least, the, I would say, the living techno legend, <laughs> West Bam. I'm squeezing yeah, in the middle. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Feel free. Right Maybe I get right. So, welcome, well guys. Thank you very much for, <laughs> you for your time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my point. That's my point. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome the one and only plastic fan. <laughs> Shame on me. <sighs> West Ham. Yeah. Is that you are a living techno legend? <coughs> Is that a minimization of you as a person? Say what? The question was whether. Is this uh, like, uh, when I call you a living techno legend, it goes down nicely, right? It's nice, you know, but it's not a way of life, though. No, you know, it's a title that you just gave me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, but uh, um, like you don't. Um, it's it's as I say, it's that is not a style of life, you know. A style of life is getting up in the morning and making some eggs for breakfast. You know, that's life. It's not about being a legend, <laughs> you know, living is not about being a legend, even if you are a living legend. Did that answer your question? <laughs> perfect, perfect answer today. <laughs> so, um, Eric, what is your definition of success? I think because you're, you're one of the, the, uh, the men who is a long time in, in music yeah, well, and you know, I was, and that's a little bit like, that's maybe one answer. Is, uh, success is nice if it stays around, you know? So like, um, the way I make records, I always, you know, and that might be a very old school idea, you know? I, I kind of always think, well, does it, in that way, does that record, will that record still sound good in 20 years or 30 years? You know, and maybe that's a very old school concept, right? Because usually people say, what is he talking about? I don't care what the record sounds like in two weeks, man. You know, because I just care about here and now, which is fair enough, you know? But, um, and that way I guess I'm a bit old school, you know? I, you know, I like Höhlenmalerei. <laughs> <You know? laughs> These geezers made these paintings like 20,000 years ago and they still look good. That's an achievement, you know, that's success. 
<laughs> so what do you say? At, at what time is a DJ a, a successful DJ? Do a DJ have to tour around the world, or is it that do I have to? Well, I, you know, I tell you something. I, I started playing for. 35 euros, that in the back in the days it was Deutschmark, uh, for 35 Deutschmark, no euros, it would, it would be like uh, 75 Deutschmarks. Uh, and I was playing for five hours for that, you know? So after half a year I got 150 Deutschmarks. And that was really successful for me, you know? Because I doubled the price, you know? So, uh, uh, yeah, that kind of like, that kind of helps, you know, uh, but, um, well, you know, like these days, I guess, success is if you can rent a Boeing and come with your whole entourage, you know, I guess, right? <laughs> That's what success feels like today, if you're coming with a whole entourage of a hundred people. And you yeah. stay together and you rent the Ritz. <laughs> yeah. And you get a half a million for the gig. And you play to 100,000 people, you know? I guess that is really big success these days. And it's quite something, you know? I, I, I never, because I, I believed in the DJs and artists like 84, 85, and it was still very exotic. But these days, I think it's, um, it's um, well, I, 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 and I could see it getting somewhere, you know? But I, I couldn't have imagined that. <laughs> you know where, where, where it's gone to? <laughs> are, the goal, are that the right, the, the current goals uh, in a career? To stay with all the friends in the Ritz Hotel? Right now? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> okay. Um, I think su success is personal. As in, uh, some might have success uh, when you play for 150 Frank. Right. Yeah, Frank. Uh, and Deutschmark. Other, Deutschmark. And other people have success when they play for in front of 100,000 people. I think you should define what your own goal is. And uh, when you've reached that goal, you have success. That, you know, like that could be a 9 to 5 job. To every, it, it's different to everyone. Is it nowadays uh, easier or more difficult getting uh, successful or become become popular like in the past? Um, the demand of DJs has grown, as in the market has become tougher. I think there's more DJs, but this, the amount of slots on festival stages or club stages didn't change that much. So it's harder to get placed on that slot. So it's it's harder. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's easier than ever because there's so much opportunities with the internet right now, which the older DJs and me myself when I started, I'm not that old, but 10 years ago, uh, we didn't have those opportunities. Uh, so I think it's, it's kind of, you have more opportunities, so it should be easier, but the market has become uh, harder as well. Yeah, because there are just a few festivals and just a few slots and you yeah. have to get a slot. Yeah, there's too many DJs who are fighting for the same slot. So maybe it's uh, necessary to have a, a good management and plastic funk, um, Rafa. Um, there's a new management behind you as a DJ. Uh, I mean, the management is not that new. Yeah, but I just signed with them. Yeah, yeah. No, no, the management is not new, but you, I think. Yeah, like, like a, a year, year, half a year, year more like a year ago we signed. Like a year ago. Do you think it's necessary for a DJ to have a big management behind? Um, not really. I mean, I think in the beginning, to start with a manager is the wrong way to start a career because then um, you're aiming for the wrong thing. I mean, first of all, it's about making music. And uh, if you find a manager who can help you to bring that music to the right labels so people hear your music, that's, I think, is the right way to go. Um, you can, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who start DJing and they uh, look for the right logo or look for the right manager, I think this is the wrong way to start. But like on my part of my career, it was uh, definitely a, a huge help to have a manager who believed in my music, who believed in my career, and opened the doors which were close for me, and now, yeah, made life easier, so now I have to deliver music. How uh, many managements did you have in the, in the past? Um, actually, it's my third management. And now the best one? 
Yeah, for sure. No, I'm at the moment I'm super happy, so I'm not thinking of uh, changing ever again. So you, you're touring uh, for all other people. It's the chef on Darburg management. So just exactly. This is a promotion. Yeah. Uh, you're touring th through uh, Asia also. Uh, some Asian countries are in your in your, in your tour. Uh, what is was it easy to build up a career in a foreign country? Um, where probably nobody knows you and it's a foreign culture? I mean, I never planned to, to, to create a career in Asia. It was just... Um, it's like after the records have been played around the world, it's, uh, it's a normal thing that people get interested in booking you. Once you're selling tickets in, in a club in a different country, people start looking up for you and just try to, to book you for a club. So it's not like you make a plan, it's like, okay, next year I want to play a lot of Mexico and now I'll work on that. That's not possible. I think, first of all, you have to have music. People have to listen to your music in, in that specific country. And uh, yeah, if you're lucky, if they love it, then the next step is uh, look for a good booking agent who uh, books you to that country and is uh, yeah, getting you good gigs. Yeah. What, what is it, was it a different story uh, for the tweakers? Or did you have a, a, a plan? <laughs> um, we definitely did not have a plan, and we still don't. Um, <laughs> we kind of just do what we like to do uh, in the studio. We have a lot, a lot of fun. We make a lot of stupid tracks. Um, ladies one being at Jägermeister, as a lot of people know. Um, and it, for us, it's all about having fun on stage and showing the people that, you know, the world It's not a frowny face, it's about you know smiling. Smile to the world and the world will smile back to you. So um, I think basically if you can call that a plan, that was our plan. Yeah. <laughs> We have a plan, I lied. So is it uh, the, the highest level at the moment of your DJ career? Right now? Yeah. I would say so, yes. Right? Am I lying again? Can you can you repeat? No. <laughs> <laughs> if we're at the highest level of our career. Yeah, I hope not. I hope we can still, you know, keep on going. Um, But at the moment, it's the highest level. Like, yeah, it's the yeah. highest we've ever been. Yeah, obviously, because like um, once once we started, we lived where we're living in Norway. We had no contact with any labels, any management, like almost no DJs within our scene either. So we had to figure things out ourselves, and we were very lucky that we got approached by. Um, a label slash event uh, manager uh, at an early point who said, "Hey, I really like. I heard your stuff on MySpace, and I, I really like it." <laughs> and he he came over, and we had great talks, and ended up signing with that label, and that's where we still are to this day. So, how long uh, did it take um, from from first beginning to now? I mean, we've been doing. The Tweakers for over 10 years now, and we signed nine years ago with a label. So yeah, it's been a long but steady journey. I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm really happy that our career hasn't been like you know skyrocketing because that has a very easy way of falling back down again. Like if it's nice and steady progress all the way, then you you kind of maintain a certain level, which is good. Is that also a thing you would like to say to other people? They just want to get, uh, or just want to be popular from zero to 100 in two days? It's impossible and not good for you in a DJ career. Well, I don't. I think it's worse for you as a human being to get famous really quickly. You see a lot of people uh, where it happens overnight. They have a tendency to, yeah like uh, hover above the earth and feel that like they are superior human beings which in my opinion um, is not the right way to be so I think um, for your personal uh, state of well-being you should take it easy um, don't uh, go with the management or label that promise you gold and diamonds uh, and you become famous overnight but yeah slow and steady wins the race normally okay cool so, last but not least, Riverstar, <laughs> give him a microphone. Yo. Yo. <laughs> I, read, I read in your German Wikipedia um, entry, article, uh, that you made a doctor's degree. Is that right? 
In Chinese, yeah. A Chinese doctor's degree. Yeah. Oh, what, is, what is about? And we're all the pairs at university, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I just like the culture, um, the history, and uh, for some reason I was playing there a lot. Uh, both as Maddox, which was my previous project, uh, around early 2000. And then as Riverstar, we even did like a, did a um, kind of an after on the Great Wall, which was great. And it was around the Olympics, a few months before the Olympics. And uh, weird enough, uh, we had to go inside every once in a while, because they were actually uh, throwing some stuff in the sky to let's say, organize the rain, and the rain was quite toxic at the time, so it was kind of a weird experience. But yeah, I, I just liked it. But then I quit right after the degree, because I had to go and live in China, and I didn't want to, I was just teaching, and I enjoyed my career, so. Do you think uh, an academic degree is a good foundation for a teacher career, like in other business uh, sectors, or it's not important? Uh, no. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> no, not really, I don't think so. Um, of course, I tell to my kids to study, even if they want to become DJs or whatever, that it's you know not related to uh, any like academic knowledge or whatever, because you know, like studying or being able to understand things is pretty important in general in life. I think, for instance, I'm talking. Uh, Italy and England side. England because I leave Italy because I was living there. Like a lot of issues we are facing right now is because there's been a, a, a constant and consistent work in making people more ignorant and that really affects every side of your life and why not even your job or your possible future jobs, your you know chances of doing things. Uh, the more you don't know, the more you become racist because you don't know about the others, you don't travel, the more you don't know, the more you don't know that you can do like uh, plenty of different uh, not conventional works, jobs right now, um, even with your knowledge, you know, like so I think it's important to study anyway. I'm not sure if it's crucial to have a degree or whatever, but even if you don't go to university but you read a lot, that's you know, for sure helping. And for you in a person also, not, not, not only for the music career. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, it gets your mind, you know, wide open and uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, so, something, a value. So knowledge is important. Uh, what about the, the look into the future? When did you decide to, to um, go up with an own record label? It took me a while, actually, because um, I uh, first wanted to do it around my Maddox project, which was breakbeat. Because I come, I come from a very like um, rock, breakbeat and drum and bass background. So I never played house music till 2005, 2006. Uh, I always been the, the black sheep in Napoli. is <laughs> uh, a quite famous techno and house uh, city. Um, but then I moved to London and I started uh, the house project. And um, I decided to actually launch the label in 2010 because I was trying to make the most of this big track I made at the time uh, with notes. These guys from Get Physical, the, the track was I was drunk. We made it quite, you know, for fun. Um, uh, but because, you know, like, you know, you, you got to have your 15 minutes in your career and um, I wanted to make the most of it. So I had a lot of press attention and stuff. So we decided to launch the label around my album. There was on a different label as well and the touring and stuff. So we launched it in 2010. It was a good move because um, we had a lot of support uh, from Beatport and from all the press, the magazines. And uh, so I, I've been privileged to actually be able, been able to to release it, uh, to launch it in a moment where I had a lot of attention, because I know it's pretty difficult to actually launch a label because there's so much, so many labels around, so many producers, so many things going on, and people's attention is very, very short. So if you get that stunt to actually uh, be able to make mm, the most of it, just do it. You know, it's definitely making your job easier. Yeah. Is it important to uh, grow up um, artist, uh, no, artist label, a record label uh, for your DJ career? Is it helpful, Joey? 
Um, I think it could really help you, but I think, like you mentioned, you first need attention. Like, uh, if you want, if you are struggling to build your own artist career and then start a label, you have two things to worry about. Like, you you have to split your focus. So I think it's smarter to first build your artist career and then, as soon as you have the attention, launch your label. Yeah. What is the biggest mistake um, of people who want to develop a DJ career? Oh, biggest mistake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a or, good one. Or, uh, let me it's a difficult one. Isn't yeah, let me ask another way. Which mistake uh, can stop your DJ career or could stop? I, I think I have one. The, the thing I see the most with artists, as, and um, it's not only with starting artists, it's almost also with artists who are at a, at a higher level, uh, is they're struggling to finish their music. And I think yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I think um, that's something I see with a lot of them. Like they start a thousand projects and they end up finishing one. Um, and I think that's that's a bad strategy. <laughs> how many tracks, Westburn? How many tracks are unfinished? No, no, I'm very quick. You know, and, and the older I get, the quicker I get as well. You know, so I don't. But I, I've I've seen that with people that when you know they start producing and they do records in five minutes and they become hits then after 10 years they think but now i'm perfectionist you know yeah. now i've got to find you know it's not really right and they work for ages then they start you know and good records usually most good records i think in any genre are done in very short time and all these records that you know they say i worked on this for half a year you know, music is a complex thing. You get it right m most of the time. You get a couple of ideas and some main elements. You get them right the first day, the second day. But then if you start like playing around, fumbling about, changing a little here, you know, the whole building kind of like changes and then it becomes wobbly and then, you know, they work on it some more and they think, oh, I'm, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. And it gets worse and worse. And people get really frustrated and they get into that. And so I've seen that when people like, they end up working on half a year and then throwing yeah. it away and working another half a year or something else. I think that, I, I think that has to do with uh, overthinking a lot. That's what, what you mentioned as well. As soon as you gain knowledge, as soon as you know more and more about music production, the knowledge is starting to stop you from putting out your creativity. Because you somehow artists are tend to start thinking in boxes when they know more about music. Like, I can't do this, I can't do that because uh, I, I can't use compression more than s minus six threshold because that's the rule. One of the most important things, which I learned at least, is that there are no rules in music production. And it sounds really corny and really simple, but it really helped me uh, in my creative process to realize that whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Because the only thing that really matters is how it sounds in the end. No one is going to ask you how you actually made it, how, how, which, which compressor you used, which uh, plugin you used to end up with a certain sound. The only thing which really matters is how is the audience going to react on it and will it will people listen to it and do you like it? Yeah, and I think uh, since uh, Egermeister we know there's no limit in music. But I completely agree with the uh, don't overthink it and then also always you know, if you, as long as you like it yourself, most likely someone else will like it too. And it looks always uh, fun when you play the track in at your festivals, at your gigs, your shows. Um, but uh, is it is it just fun or is it also work? I think the most of the people who watch your your Instagram story looks like ah they have a nice life, but I think um, a DJ career or a DJ job isn't easy as it looks like. It's it's definitely not for everyone. I can I can I can say that. Um, it's a lot of a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, sleepless nights, uh, two hours here and then fly to the next city. Um, it's a lot of fun when you're on stage, um, but yeah, it's quite quite the heavy uh, lifestyle, especially if you want to yeah party and drink every every single uh, weekend. 
which we have a habit of doing. Um, but I, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's tough to say. Um, I don't think everybody is fit for this lifestyle, but if you are, then by all means go full force. Yeah. But, but you gotta be careful because if you wanna continue doing this for many years, then you have to have a healthy lifestyle. Do you have a healthy lifestyle? Absolutely yeah. not. It's <laughs> <laughs> like just water. It's right? just water, yeah. <laughs> Sponsored water. <laughs> So, uh, do you think you, you can um, put your healthy life on a higher level? Definitely. Do you yes. have to do it? Uh, at some point, I think you are gonna, or I will wake up uh, and realize that uh, I just cannot continue living this lifestyle. But I mean, I'm going to be honest that when we do the festival season, which mainly because we both live in, in Belgium and Holland, uh, where all the festivals are mainly, um, we drive to the bookings ourselves. I just want to say there is no water there. So then there actually is water. <laughs> um, and then we, we just, it's a nice way to just, you know, relax. But usually if we fly to the clubs, then we have a tendency to empty a bottle or two. Yeah. So you're, you're of water. <laughs> <laughs> Plastic fan, Rafa. Should, should I call you Plastic Funk or Rafa? Plastic Funk is still... Uh, Rafa. Rafa, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, do you, yeah. what do you think about... Uh, you, or, um, you are also a DJ for, uh, I think, 15 years now? Yeah, at what? least 15 years. Yeah. What about your healthy lifestyle? I mean, it's like, uh, I like to travel, so it's not annoying me so much. I mean, the problem is the... The jet lags, the not sleeping once in a while, like especially when you're on tour for a longer time, um, and you you try to sleep but you can't. I mean, this is just burning you out. But on the other side, um, if you want to do this job and you decide to to really do this full time, you uh, need to know that this is going to happen if you like really work hard on it. And um, I mean, the thing is, like when I'm on stage, it gives me so much back that. I don't care about sleepless nights anymore. And if you come to this point that these shows are not giving you that energy back, I think you should stop and do something else, that's for sure. But the good thing is when you're touring and uh, traveling around the world, you can uh, put all this photo and video stuff on Instagram, which always looks nice for other people. So it works and it, it's good for your interaction, your social media interaction, right? Yeah, the videos and the pictures is always the nice part. Like all the dirty part, like uh, falling asleep, missing flights, uh, get screwed by promoters and all this stuff, you don't post actually. But yeah, you have a lot of footage for, for social media, which is not too bad. So how, how much time do you spend daily for your social media? Um, actually, I'm not a big fan of social media. It's a pain in the ass for me. I really have to push myself to do <laughs> stories and stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's part of the business. And uh, sometimes I just like to share stuff I see on tour. Uh, especially funny stuff, but uh, yeah, you just, I mean, I try to show people where I am, what I'm doing, and, um, but I try to keep it as, yeah, in a, at a minimum. Yeah, Westbam, I saw you have an Instagram account since a few weeks, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there's something happening, I heard about this new thing, it's called the internet. <laughs> you, you should check it out. I'm, I'm giving away secrets now. Yeah, I think there are three or four thousand followers. It should be more, I think. Yeah, well, you know, as, as you know, I'm just a beginner, you know. Yeah, that's just a humble beginning. It's getting more, bro. Maybe you can get an artist coaching from Choizuki. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So, do you, you think Choizuki is uh, uh, social media uh, the, the most important thing for an artist at the moment? Or is it... Uh, not true. Uh, well, music is the most important thing, of course, but social media can definitely help you to build your career. It's, it's a nice outlet, which you didn't have 10 years ago, to, uh, to gain an audience, especially abroad, you know, in different countries. Right now, you can reach people in, in Asia just by one click, and that used to be a, l a lot more difficult. Yeah, and I must say one thing, you know, because people mock about uh, social media, blah, blah, blah. But then again, what I think is really cool about it, you know, back in the days, you know, to g get attention, you would have to go through so many filters, you know, like a radio or club play by other DJs or, or, uh, or whatever. 
And so I think uh, artists of the day are quite fortunate. You can like build up your whole whole new own thing, and no matter how others ignore you, you can build up your own following. You know, and that's a good thing. I think. That's actually the, one of the main things that I keep pushing towards my clients or anyone else that I'm talking to. I think don't they don't really understand how fortunate they should be that they have those opportunities you know like exactly. 10 years ago 20 years ago other people were deciding what what was going to happen with your career they were going to decide if your check was going to be released if you're going to get that booking or whatever right now even if everyone tells you no and you still think it's a yes you still have the option to put it out on Spotify on iTunes and prove them wrong you know and now it's up to you now it's up to you to say all, to all the ANRs who have denied your tracks in the future, if you still believe in your product, it's up to you. You, you have to put in the work yourself and prove them wrong. And now, you know, now it's available. 20 years ago it wasn't. So you should be fortunate that the options are there. At least I think. Thank you, Last week you dropped a new album, Esper. I did, yes. An uh, album uh, called Risky Sets with Drake, Kendrick Lamar, Lil Wayne, Wiz Khalifa, Busta Rhyme. Oh, yeah. Bravo, it's My black kind of people. It's a Bravo, it's a black population. <laughs> no, it's, it, it isn't. It's good music. But um, sure, yeah. why do you decide to use uh, the, the artist from, from the state? Yeah. Oh, 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 well, you know, like, I'm, I, I must give it up for the, the brothers from the states, you know, like, all my major influences came from there, the, the Chicago DJs and everything, you know. Uh, and like Africa Bambada, the BAM and my name come from Bambada, you know, so uh, I gotta give it up for the brothers, you know. And, uh, you know, for me, like, you know, I mean, again, I come from a time when these kind of artists were still in one pool together, you know. In the beginning, like early 80s, there was not a big division between like house or hip hop, you know, because that was all, you know, like with, with hip hop these days, you hardly see it, or now you start to see it again. But for ages, it had been like almost like a music that is not rem reminiscent of dance culture. But hip hop, house, you know, it basically started uh, with dance music, you know, it's all party music. So, uh, and, you know, if you've got the, you know, if they're willing to do a track with you or if they give you some nice vocal, why not, you know, why not? And maybe it's also good for your marketing strategy. It's good for my what? For your marketing strategy. For my marketing, yeah, yeah, right. I heard like these guys are really famous, right? <laughs> some people say even more famous than me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's fine. But th then again, you know, actually, if you do, uh, you know, because I, I don't think my music and what I do caters so much to the, the average Drake listener. So I don't expe expect so much like, how do you call this? Wie heißt das Wort noch? Ich weiß nicht mal im Deutschen. Synergie. Synergy, 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 right. I, saw, I don't think that, you know, but but still it's, uh, for me, to have Drake on my record is more of a element of irritation. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what I like about it. <laughs> but the good thing is there's a second uh, uh, one with the dub versions without... Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, but then again, I, you know, I really love vocals. I always did, you know. I like to talk a lot as well, you know, I, I, like you hear, yeah. and so like, yeah, no, I, li I like vocals, but then uh, every once in a while I realize that my DJ said, uh, I say like, Max, come on, play one or two instrumental beats, you know, because the people don't need sound on a classical techno party, people get, you know, mixed up, if you play too many lyrics, I think it's irritating, you know, because they used to like more like, <laughs> You know, so then I force myself to play one or two instrumentals, man. It's good. It's good for my set. It's good for my people too. You know, so I try. I try. You know, <laughs> River Star. You decided uh, a few years ago uh, to make house music. Do you think it's necessary or essential for a DJ career? 
to uh, put out our music or maybe also can be a DJ uh, and just play stuff from, from other people? You can definitely just be a DJ and play stuff from other people. It's a bit different if you are um, a producer because uh, and you are not a DJ because um, I think m m what really helps me is actually to test my tracks in the club when I finish them to test the sound how because okay you can have like a general uh, opinion on how it sounds and the edit and stuff but only playing it uh, in the zone you know like when you're in the club with other tracks uh, different uh, speed and, and stuff that lets you understand um, uh, the flows, you know, like where, where the problems are and uh, and then you just go back to the studio and fix them whereas if you're just a producer sometimes you get locked into an idea that it's maybe developing in a different way in the club because I think the club has its own life um, so for me it's important to be a DJ uh, as well as a producer um, and it doesn't work if you're just a producer, from, from my point of view. I'm but from, but is, it a, is it a problem, that, that's a question for all of you, when you are just a DJ and like to, to play shows and stay in front of people, but you are not a producer and uh, you just uh, get a producer, a ghost producer? Is it, uh, I think it's common, uh, it, it's common, but it's a problem for a career or is it not? No, I don't think so. Also, it's depending on the ghost producers, right? So, uh, there are people that use producers uh, as a right hand, right? So they have their own ideas um, and have the, the technician uh, making the most of the technical stuff, making the sounds, uh, but with a direction, right? And there are other people that just pay some money and get some tracks. They just maybe send a brief. So that's the main difference, in my opinion. I, don't know. I think this is a big controversy at this moment. In, in uh, well, not at this moment, always has been. I think everyone has their own opinions. Uh, what my opinion is is that if you have a look at the pop industry for instance Beyonce for instance if you have a look at their album and look how many people have worked on one track I think it's I think it's definitely a great idea as a as an producer if you feel like you're struggling with let's say mixing or mastering or you're not that great at melodies to get someone on the team to help you with it and to make the end product better um, at least that's what I think. I, I like to approach an artist career as, an, as a business, as a regular business. And if you can make your product better by getting someone on the team, why not? So we have to close the romantic lesson. Uh, music I, is not a I just think it, um, in the, in the business case? Yeah, well, I think it's not. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's been romantic. Uh, people make it romantic, but I, I think that's not the case in most cases romantic to me. Yeah, it is, but you know, per music is personal, of course, And but if you come up with an ID, uh, but you struggle to, let's say, I, th I think people have different skills. So, for instance, you can make uh, melodies, perfect melodies or perfect rhythms, but mixing is a completely different skill than p playing the piano. And I just don't think that but one person is capable of doing everything at a high level. But I think, like, when you mention melodies, I, I use singers because I can't sing, yeah. but it doesn't not make me a producer because I'm yeah. using a singer. So having someone playing the melodies means maybe having a musician in the studio and I normally use a, use a musician. I think the, the question here is more about uh, if a DJ should make his own music uh, in order to have a DJ career or not. For me, yeah. it's not a problem. Everyone yeah. is free to do whatever. Uh, they want. Everyone is free to choose the style of music they want and not for this reason they need to be A level or B level. Every, you know, every sort of music has its own dignity uh, in my point of view and uh, it, it's all about what you actually want in your career. If you want, if you are, your passion is making music and actually see people enjoying your music while you play your own music in the club, that's a goal. Uh, if your main goal is just to go and make shadows of money and travel and rent a whole a suite for, for the Ritz, uh, and that means just you know paying someone that is a top producer and having the songs done, that's another goal. 
I don't see the problem really. You know, it's all about whatever you want in life. So. Yeah, I agree. I just, I just think you have to think if you're, for yourself what your goal is. For instance, I always make my music myself. I mixed it, but mastering wasn't my best skill, so I, I outsourced my mastering uh, because I didn't have a perfect studio. I didn't. I just had a bedroom studio. Uh, and I couldn't get it at the level where I wanted it to be, so I hired someone to do it for me. So let's talk about new music. That we guess what's about new music? Is there something upcoming? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have uh, plenty of new music actually. That is seven or eight tracks that are unreleased. So for the festival season? Yes, absolutely. The, the struggle when you have a lot of unreleased music is to find the time to release everything and give everything some some headroom. For, for the viewers and listeners at home as well to enjoy the tracks because if you we always had the, the, the feeling that if you drop an album let's say 12 or 15 or 20 tracks the the fans are gonna you know gonna listen through it they're gonna find four or five tracks that they really really like and the rest is just gonna become fillers yeah that's uh, it, that's a lot of the case in, in hard style music at least. So we try to give every every track the same amount of attention. So at least a month, a month and a half between every track instead of dropping everything at once. Good, uh, because, uh, but the, the festival season is uh, safe. Oh yes, yeah. oh yes, so we'll, we'll try to release. <laughs> what about your festival uh, season, Rafa? Uh, I think there's still, you played last year uh, World Cup Dome two times and some other shows around Germany, Europe and Yeah, Europe. next year is looking interesting, for this sure. Year, this year. Uh, I can't wait for, for summer, for sure. And uh, we talked about the productions, I just think, um, because it was about producers uh, being producers and artists like trying to get records together with a producer. I think there's a lot of producers out there who are like amazingly talented, but without the right input, they're just stuck in their studio and do the same thing forever. I think there's a lot of really talented DJs with the right ideas, but without a producer, they never bring the music to the clubs. So if you combine this, I mean, it's the same with us. Uh, we were producing forever and never really made it to that point that music that the music was successful. On that point where we met just a couple of friends who were our studio neighbors and we made the team a little bit bigger, it gave our music the last step to really make it out there to the right labels. So I think to combine this, as long as you really like, like you said, like the, you like what you do, you really do music for the music, you know, to make money. Um, sure, I mean, make money in the day is not bad, but like to make music because you want to produce that track and you have that idea in your head, I mean, then it totally makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of people, like you said, who just go use music like in a supermarket, you know, just order it and uh, yeah, yes, and just release it. Uh, yeah, the question was uh, the festival season, right? So festival season this year is going to be fun. Yeah, there's a lot of big festivals coming up all over the globe and uh, I can't wait for the summer. Um, but I also like the winter because uh, winter means more like about clubs. I, I love clubbing. I love to uh, be close to, to people and uh, just um, have a good time and a good party. And since we spoke uh, a few days ago, you have, you are, uh, have a contract with a new management a year, a year ago, I think. Uh, and the Stefan Dabrock management is also Robert Schulz and Dal Farm in that management. Do you think it's good um, in your situation to have that management because maybe the next sing signal is a um, track with Robert Schulz or something like that? Um, not with Robert, but maybe with someone else. Uh, you never know. I mean, we have a lot of stuff ready. Uh, there's uh, some collabs coming for sure. And uh, you never know. I mean, it's good to have that team, and I like how the management is trying to create a family who works together and support each, uh, each other. I think this is the most important thing, and there's a lot of countries who work much better together than Germany. Germany never, I mean, the last couple of years never really worked together. Everyone is doing his own thing, more or less. In the last two years, it got a bit better. People start like uh, doing call ups together and try to, managements try to create a family which is supporting each other. So. It's getting better. So to be part of the Stefan Daro management, that's exactly what he tried to do and it worked out. I mean, everyone is doing his thing and we all work together, kind of. Yeah, it's definitely good to be part of a family like that. And uh, working together is also uh, part of being at the Mixcom. Um, I think that's one of the 
best things that uh, all the people from Germany and maybe Europe are meeting together today and tomorrow here in Munich. Uh, so are there any questions um, to the tweakers, Choizuki, West Bam, Riverstar or the Plastic fan? You would like to say, yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a question, uh, ask a question to Plastic Fun. Um, yes. Yeah. Before I used to follow you a lot, well, I still do. But, uh, <laughs> you still follow me? Okay. And I remember that before, around 2009, 2010, you would release a lot of tech house. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. And then in uh, 2012, you released Who? With Tujamo, which I think was like a very big hit. And it was something completely different from what you were making. Yes, and I just want you to know, is that, do you see that as an opportunity, let's say I make these cows and this guy makes me makes EDM and he's like, check out this track, and if it's a banger, do you think I should step into that, so that <coughs> maybe, I'm going to put my name out there, like you said, collab and eventually get, but even though it's not the kind of genre that I make, that I like to make. It's a pretty good question, because, um, should we, should we uh, tell the question again? Because I, don't, I think nobody heard it. Uh, he asked uh, if it's a good uh, idea to uh, change their, the, the music style because you did uh, Tech House before and then afterwards uh, your actual pop or future house style. Pop style. Pop <laughs> style. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we, I'm a house head. We always did house music. This is where I come from. Um, and actually, if you listen to Who or some of the other tracks we were releasing during that time, it has the same groove. It just has a different lead melody. And I think the worst thing you can do is to put yourself into a genre and you don't give yourself the opportunity to break out of this. I think this is what Joey just said, is um, if you just do music and do whatever you like without thinking of any borders, any genre, which is... <coughs> which is there because people just give you these genres, I think this is the way to be successful. We had uh, like at least three or four years where we were like going left and right because we tried to find that style of music where we want to go to. We still didn't really find it, which is great because it gives us the opportunity every time we go to the studio to create something new. And actually at the moment I'm really happy because I can do whatever and most of the stuff gets signed. I mean, stuff, some stuff the labels or the managers don't like, and then I try to do some, some uh, free downloads. The most important thing is, to make long story short, is uh, do whatever you feel like, and don't think about genres or like what some other people think. You know, it is your music. It's not what other people do. Can I think the DJ is also developing itself, so... Yeah, I mean, the best thing is when you're like, uh, you have the chance to try whatever. Take a, a hip hop vocal, create, put it together with a tech house track, and maybe a new style is there. You know, I would never like think of of genres. Just do whatever you feel like. Can I add something to that? I would I would use collaborations uh, as the perfect uh, opportunity to go out to a different genre because it's not weird if you do a collaboration with someone from a completely different genre. Your fans expect it to sound different. So it's 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 the perfect opportunity for you for you as as an, as an artist brand to have a look in a different genre and see how that sounds. Maybe it, it creates something new, you know, because you combine two two different things and you create some new genre or new style or whatever. So I think it brings you multiple opportunities. Uh, yeah. All right. It's just that I don't know when you. I think that maybe when you're starting and you want to let's say I produce deep house and I want to get known by producing deep house and maybe I step into something completely different still while I'm you know trying to build my fan base I don't know if that's a good idea and maybe like Plastic Funk was already known it was big so when he made to move it to so you know it's uh, yeah. a strong artist made something which is cool but I mean, I know what you mean. The, the problem is if you go left and right with every record, like you release a rap record and the next track, your follow up is a deep house track, it's pretty tough to really create a fan base because people never know what to expect when you release a track. I think it's most important is to, to create your sound and follow this lead because if you have, you found your sound, your, your style, 
you will follow up with this. I mean, you maybe um, put it to an, another level with the next record, but you have your style. To have your unique sound, I think that's pretty important that people hear a track and it's like, okay, hey, this is you. Um, but still, I would like, I mean, it's important to try different styles and just add them to your sound and bring your, your sound to a different level. Okay, next questions. Are there any questions? Uh, maybe to Datrikas and Joey, um, you you know something about the hard style scene. Um, myself, I'm an, I'm an absolute no name as a DJ, and I'm I'm really at the beginning. And I try that uh, my USP is creating ma edits and mashups of existing tracks, hard style tracks. And uh, how do you get out there into the scene to event promoters, to event organizers? How do you get them to to book you as a DJ? Because you you've got something unique which you can offer, but uh, DJ contests are uh, a bit problematic because you, you send over your, your entry and uh, not only the, the guy wins which put a lot of effort into his DJ set, but the guy wins with uh, most uh, Facebook likes or Instagram followers um, because the promoter wants, wants something, uh, some, some artist uh, who was able to, to fill the club or fill the event. Um, do you have any, any suggestions? So, so the question is, uh, I think, how to get the, to, the contact to bookers and uh, the reason why they should book you when you're a DJ, but only a mashup DJ. Right. Yeah. I'm going to be totally honest with you. <laughs> so one, once I started DJing, uh, like we started, Marcus started when you were 13, right? And I started around the same time as well. And what I noticed really quickly is that, you know, there is a lot of DJs that are spinning other people's music, right? And it's really hard to attract, other than your really close fans, uh, friends, you know, who think it's really cool that you're, that you're a DJ, you know, but if you're gonna make it anywhere, you need to create something unique, you know, something that people um, assign to you, you know, like they remember, oh, he made that song, or he, yeah, in, in your case, a mashup. But a mashup is, uh, it's a niche market, you know, you can make a, you can make a cool mashup, but it's still someone else's yep. work, right? right? So, as soon as you start making your own music and people start noticing you, then uh, the gigs will follow, you know? It, it's, it's, it's a natural, I've already talked about this, all the, all the guys here already said it, you know, as soon as you, start believing in your own sound and creating something unique. I want to also want to say one of the biggest failures that DJs do, uh, producers do. Speaking to me. No, no, it's just coming back to it before I forget it, is that once they start producing, they, they copy someone else's sound, like to the key. Like that happens so much in our style. Oh, that artist is really popular right now, so I'm just gonna copy everything that he does in my structure. And that's not going to take you anywhere because that there's already one DJ that sounds like that. There's, there's no point of being another DJ. That so you have to develop your own signature, your own sound. sound. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. But yeah, back to uh, <laughs> back to that. Yeah, I I really feel like if you want to get somewhere, you need to create your own content, or else it's yeah, it's really hard to make it in the music industry. I agree. I think you should create a lot of value for yourself as an artist. Because the way I see it, when it comes down to promoters, like club owners, I, I divide them in two different kind of promoters. There's maybe a few more, but most of them are these two. They either book you because you make their money, you sell them tickets, that's one of them. And the other one is you're that new talent that they would like to have on their stage. So you have to find a way to, to become interesting, either that you're so big enough that you start to make their money, or you're a talent which bubbles up in the industry, which, um, how do you say that in, in, in English? Um, like they would, they would give you the opportunity at first, you know, like they, they would like to be the first that booked you because, so that they can say in two years from now, like I was the first one who, I saw him, you know, like I was the first one. Um, that's the way I see promoters. So it's either building value, enough value to become interesting enough to get booked. So they make money on, you, on your back uh, or become, interesting enough so that you're that talent guy who comes down for a smaller fee but still get booked. Okay. Just to break it down into simple options, there's probably a few more but I think these are the main ones. Good, thank you very much.
Are there any more questions? Yeah. Um, setting up one or two, two hour mixes from Mixcloud, Soundcloud, and podcasts certainly got its point. But I want to know from you um, um, did you ever get addressed by a booker, by a festival? I said, hey, I listened to your mix on Mixcloud that was fabulous, and I book you because of that. Because it's a lot of effort if you put up a regular basis mixes there. Is it worth it or not? Oh, it's, it's surely, it's fun, and it's a good way to practice and get your, show your skills. Um, but I, I personally never had a, a promoter or anything coming and say, I listened to your uh, uh, mix on that podcast or, or on, on Mixcloud or uh, what used to be a very good SoundCloud. Um, but to, to be fair, it is, for some, the only, only way to do it. And... Um, I think that good music is good music, and good music is, speaks, speaks for itself. Doesn't matter what genre. Uh, uh, and a good DJ, uh, if a good DJ can can have a good track list, good progress in the mix, uh, good transitions, everything, then promoters will hear it. People will discover it. It's not um, without reason that that yeah, famous DJs are famous, most likely because they are good producers and also they have good DJ skills. I think I think it's really hard for a DJ to find out how people actually why people actually book you. At least that what that's what I noticed. Like some of you book them because you're part of a big agency. Some of you book you because they know your tracks. Some of them book you because they've listened to your podcast. Some of them because a friend told them that you were the guy to book. It's really hard to find out how they actually got to you. Uh, at least when you're not the biggest name out there. What I believe, but I have a, a kind of positive mindset, um, and please stop me when I talk too much, um, but what I believe is you should do as much content as possible. Yeah? You never know what's going to be the reason for a booker to book you. And that could be that podcast episode. If you hit him at the right time, at the right moment, that could be the reason for him to, to book you. You never know. And um, a, a podcast is an, is an excellent uh, form of content for an artist to, to display what he does during a set or however you would like to fill it in. You can, you can do different kinds of podcasts. You're not, you're not obligated to just do a mix of 60 minutes. You can create a radio show out of it. Start talking in between tracks. And start inviting guests. Do interviews. There's a lot of ways to, to build something. Uh, but yeah, to, to come down to my main point, you never know what's going to get you booked and I would, I would say get as many opportunity, opportunities out there as possible and a podcast is one of them. <laughs> but it's a very time intense. Uh, well to me it, took me it only took me like two hours a week so it depends on how, how you approach it. I just made a mix in Ableton uh, and if the mix was one hour it took me like an hour and a half, two hours to mix it. But if you do a really like radio show with guests and stuff, yeah that's more work. Okay, last question. Is there any question left? Come on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I have a question for the tweakers. Um, you talked about unreleased tracks. So is it um, you, you have an idea, um, put uh, some melodies on it, or for example you have a melody in your head, um, create a melody and then you, you stop or continually um, doing this thing saying okay I'm proving this song now or maybe uh, okay mm, I have a, maybe t um, in one week I have another idea uh, so I can go back to the project in one week and um, work to, uh, one week later on it or so the, the, the question is yeah <laughs> I don't get it for sure I guess <laughs> how a track comes together yeah, I guess. yeah. 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 How, how long does it take or yeah 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 when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you stop having some ideas yeah well um with me and marcus um we have very divided tasks in the studio like a lot of duos you'll see that one is the producer and the other guy is more of the social media taking care of all the back end stuff while the other guy gets to work, right? But for us, we're, we are really 50-50 in, in the studio. But usually it starts with me sitting at home, jamming along with melodies, maybe downloading a vocal sample from Splice and just messing around until I have something that I think is worthy to show Marcus. I don't show him, I don't send him voice clips every five minutes every time I have a melody. 
at least not anymore. But like, <laughs> I usually, you know, once I, I think that I have a cool idea, I will send it to Marcus and then he will say, this is good or this is bad. If he says it's good, everything goes on to Dropbox. He's a morning person, so he's there 9 a.m., starts working on sounds. And then I'll come in in the afternoon when I wake up and continue working on the arrangement. And it goes back and forth like that until the track is done. And that, if, if we're very effective, a track can be done in two days, I would say, to at least try it at a club. But uh, if you want a final product that you're satisfied with, that you want to put on Spotify, I think we need at least a week or two <coughs> minimum for to really be happy and satisfied. Right. Okay. And, yes. uh, what is the ratio of uh, release versus unreleased tracks? Uh, I mean, uh, if you, if one of the big mistakes is not finishing tracks. Um, for every track that gets released, how many tracks do you throw in the trash? Like, because sometimes at some point you have to recognize uh, this is shitty and uh, don't get like too emotionally attached. So what's the ratio? That's yeah. Uh, we were, uh, I was having a discussion with um, pegboard nerds. We, we did a collab with them uh, for, for Tomorrowland last year, and that track is actually ironically not released yet. But um, I was asking Alex, the producer from, uh, from pegboard nerds, are you going to look back at your career and say, damn it, I, I wish I didn't release that track because it doesn't sound good? Probably not, you know? Like, if you're happy at the moment with the track, I, there's there's no point in hesitating, saying I shouldn't put this out unless it's really offensive or really you know weird, and then maybe show your management at least and let them give you a thumbs up before you release it. But uh, I, I I honestly I don't think in 30 years I'm gonna look back at our career and say I I wish I didn't release this or that song, you know. I, it's a part of it's a part of your your creative um, process to 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 try new ideas and try uh, do new things and you might as well give it to your fans uh, or else it's just gonna dust away on an old on an old hard drive. Yeah, I think if we get as far as not really sure what to do with the track, we give it away for free still. Um, a lot of times because it's a bootleg or just a fun edit. But we have a tendency to just give give it away, not not put it on Spotify. But you know, no revenue. This is for the fans, um, usually for Christmas or any other excuses. <laughs> <laughs> so, if there are any uh, more questions, the uh, the guys will be here for a few minutes or hours. So maybe you can see the guys tonight at the Neubau. They are yeah. playing yeah. the three cast. Uh, West Ham, you are in Nuremberg. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Riverstar, you are playing uh, today or tomorrow? Today. Pasha. Today at Pasha. A plastic fang? I don't know. It's my first free night in a long time. <laughs> I'm going to stop by, uh, listen to Riverstar, and I will stop by the Tweakers for an hour. So, so I hear the Jägermeister track in China. I'm going to see it live. So. I saw Chinese singing Jägermeister, so this is something special for sure. <laughs> And Shoizuki, you also enjoying the, your time in hotel, right? Yeah, I'm gonna stay in hotel, yeah. yeah. Got no playing for me. So, my last question to all of you, um, maybe you can answer in one sentence. What is your advice to develop a successful DJ career? Uh, Damn it, one sentence? Yeah. <laughs> so, all we talked about in the last hour in one sentence. Uh, I mean, yeah, be yourself. I mean, enjoy your, your own music, stay unique. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, just don't think about it as a career because if you start stressing out too much about making it, uh, you end up just doing the wrong choices. So if you just go down your, to your passions and make what you actually like and feel, and it's going to come if it has to come. Um, I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would say don't care about other people's opinions as in everyone would give you their opinion on their music but the only thing that really matters is what you think of it so don't let other people hold you back from releasing it or doing whatever you want to do with it uh. yeah it, I would say be crazy step out of the box 
don't overthink too much because it's your sound, you choose what you're gonna do with your music and if you believe in it strong enough, then your fans will follow. Are you okay, okay with that? He speaks on behalf of the duo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much guys. <laughs> Hi, sorry, two seconds. Yep. Is it possible to take a photo with you? Yeah, sure, yeah. I'm a follower of your artist. Nice, talking. thank you. Nice thank to you. meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you man. very much. Thanks for following me. <laughs> <laughs> How long is your stay? Uh, until tomorrow evening, okay. and then I'll go back home. Are you still here tomorrow, right? Sorry? Are you still here tomorrow? Yeah, uh, only afternoon. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow then. Go on. I'll be around another day. Cool. <laughs> Bye. Hmm. Hello. Where are you from? From Holland. Holland? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm uh, from uh, the south of the United Tilburg. It's like uh, the, with the, on the border with Belgium. Yeah, okay. it's down south. Uh, I'm from Munich. Okay, this is my first time here, I guess. I, really? I don't remember being here. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about it when I flew in. I was like, have I ever been here? Okay. I don't think so. Yeah. So what do you do? Uh, I'm a DJ. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm dancing on many different weddings. <laughs> I'm not. A, I'm also a wedding DJ. But okay. The problem is, I want to get into club DJing more. Mm -hmm. I'm into it, and I want to get into producing too. One okay. of the best sentences you made was, "Concentrate on one thing first, and then do the next." Yeah. I kind of feel overwhelmed. Yeah. By and I think that's one of the the, the big mistakes a lot of people get. You know, like there's just you need to do a lot of things as an yeah. artist, and if you get started by doing everything, you end up doing nothing yeah. uh, they start overthinking they start procrastinating they start doing nothing yeah. so I would say focus on one thing if you want to learn how to make music focus on making music for one year and see how where that takes you you know uh, but if you want to say like I want to go to clubs and I need a bigger network spend a year on networking yeah. I think focusing on one thing is, is effective okay. people try to multitask too much nowadays yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've, I think I do a lot, and I think I, mm -hmm. I make a lot of progress, um, but it is, it is such, you're multitasking, you're doing your web page, you're doing Facebook, uh, I, I even leave Instagram out, even though I think, oh, I need to do Instagram, because yeah, yeah. I need the younger kids. It's stuff, a lot, you know, you, know? Like, you, you first have to start small and start adding those styles piece by piece, uh, and that's like, you can't complete the whole building at once, you know? like you have to start building from the ground up so that's my advice <laughs> and it's a lot I know what kind of people do you counsel I mean there isn't um, you take an artist and you say okay I only take artists that have a certain career ahead of them. Uh, not necessarily there is an intake procedure but that's mainly for me to see if I have a click with the person because um, I don't want to work with someone that I don't like <laughs> simple and or that I don't believe in because if there's someone coming to me saying oh this is my dream and I want to do this but I don't really get the feeling that, that that's gonna work out or whatever or it's not the way I would like to do it or yeah I'm not gonna work with them so that's the only thing I'm actually looking for uh, alongside that most of the clients are people that want to make their hobby their work yeah so they need to make their shift from doing it just for fun to making a living out of it that's that's my main clients and then you have another percentage which is like the higher uh, level of, uh, of DJs who are already traveling the world who are already having an audience uh, who are making a living out of it yeah. but they need they need different guidance because that's where the mental part comes in so the touring stuff and the stress and that does something with your mind and with your personal life uh, so it's a different kind of coach so every person I coach 
is a custom custom package. I'm, I'm a totally different kind of thing. Yeah, I have a I have a regular job and mm -hmm. I earn good money. And I'm, when I leave this job, I'm going to have a lot of money. <laughs> and so <coughs> I have another client, <laughs> same same story. Like he has a he has a regular job, yeah. he has enough money, but he says this is my hobby and I want to do it more right. and more and more. And eventually, yeah. when I'm not working this job anymore, I want to do DJing and producing full time. Yeah. The only thing that really matters is how, how much do you really want it, you know? Like, uh, what's your dream? Would you still like to travel the world as a big DJ? That's a, that's a good question. Or would you say, like, you know, playing locally in clubs, that's okay with me? Because, probably. yeah, that's, that's probably more yeah. me. And that's okay. Uh, I, I like to travel, but I probably wouldn't like to travel as much as these guys do. In the way that they do it as yeah. well, yeah. It's that's different and it's hard. Single lifestyle, even though you might have a partner and yeah. such. And yeah, let me tell you this. I became a father 10 months ago and I quit okay. DJing four years ago. I was doing the same schedules as they do right now. That led me to going into a burnout. Okay. Uh, and from that moment on, I started thinking like, is this the way I want to get older? Because I was 25 at that moment. And I decided like, no, this, this is not a lifestyle that fits me as a person. I've seen it, I've lived it and I've decided no, it's not gonna work for me. Right now I have what people call the boring life. Uh, kind of a 9 to 5, like I, I don't work from 9 to 5, I work for myself, so I work whenever I want, I'm free to go, I have a little kid, I go home every evening, I have the weekends with the family, and that's what I want right now, so right. I'm happy, priority, yeah. Right? yeah, and I think that's the only thing you should care about, like what makes you happy, yeah. and if that's playing uh, locally once a week, that's all you should focus on, right? Yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My name is Rune. Hi. Um, what do you think about this idea of getting a better chance to get signed by labels by uh, sending the tracks to other DJs mm -hmm. and not directly to the promo or demo mails mm -hmm. from the labels because they have a lot of mails every day? Yeah. I think that's I think that's a great strategy. You know, like getting DJ support, getting other mainly big. DJ supporting your music is a great way to get an interest in labels because as soon as the bigger DJs start playing your music they will be more interested and the reason for that is because they will make more sales that's the only thing they're interested in it's like a little guarantee for them before getting the, the yeah you know if, if uh, for instance Martin Garrix Chesto and uh, and Axel and Grosso play your track then they know they will make more sales because it reaches a bigger crowd but if you are the only one playing it or no one's playing it it's hard for them to to market the track and to, to sell the track so getting DJ support is, is a great way to uh, to reach an audience and to, to become more interested for labels yeah, but it's, it's uh, also hard for them uh, to get to a like guys like Martin Garrix. Yeah, huh? that's the hardest thing. Yeah. Okay, so maybe looking up to the DJ, they are sending a little bit above uh, in the DJ career. Or yeah, or maybe like underneath, you know, like uh, sending it, uh, start sending it out to local guys. Like if you know local DJs who play a lot, or if you know someone who's already touring, send it to them. Like don't don't only focus on the bigger ones out there because there's a shitload of DJs underneath there which are, still have an audience. It's like thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. Yeah. It's not two million, yeah. but if you have 20 DJs supporting you, which have 5,000 followers, it's still a lot. Yeah, you're right. It's the power of the masses. It's what I underrated, I think, so. All, everyone focuses on the bigger ones, but there's so many people on Anita, That's which good. you can easily reach out to. That's good. Yeah. So, thank yeah? you very much. And yeah, no nice problem. time in Germany. Yeah. No problem, okay. thank you, man. <laughs>